All right, guys. My guest this afternoon, Louis Prima Jr., is music royalty. His dad, Louis Prima, was known as the King of Swing with his high energetic shows in New Orleans jazz. Fans from all over the world jumped, jived, and wailed to his music. His son, Louis Prima Jr., has definitely followed in his famous father's footsteps. Louis Prima Jr. and the Witnesses are a blend of high energy, fun, and most of all, great music. His album, Return of the, to the Wild and Blow, are a testament to his dad's legacy and great jazz music. You can hear Louis Prima Jr.'s music at Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, as well as his website, through his website, louisprimajr.com. Uh, what a thrill for me to have him on the show this afternoon. Uh, Louis Prima Jr., Louis, first of all, thank you so, so much for your time this afternoon. Oh, thank you for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, obviously, I mean, your dad, um, such a huge influence on not only jazz, um, you know, I mean, talk about being a little kid, because I know you were young when he passed away. Did, did you ever get a chance to really see him on, perform on stage? Yes, I did. And, you know, he, he wasn't just a huge influence on jazz. He, he has influenced people across every musical genre um, with his 50 years of music and switching switching strides every time it needed to be done going from small combo to big band to small combo to rock and roll um but yeah i was uh i was very fortunate uh, to be able to see him quite a few times when i was young um we used to i mean when i was very young uh we used to sit in the sound booth at, or i'm sorry the light booth at the sands hotel in las vegas wow. and wow. watch his show and uh, during the summers, um, when we weren't in, you know, when I wasn't in school, we got to travel with my father. We would, uh, we would go to New Jersey to um, Tom's River Seaside Heights for a couple of weeks to be with my grandparents on my mom's side, uh, and then we would meet up with my father and hit the road. And I got to see him everywhere, uh, you know, Chicago, Philly, New Orleans, you name it. Um, and he, you know, drug us up on stage every once in a while to. Wow. Uh, sing a little wow. song or I would tell dirty jokes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad was discovered by this. I did, did not, this I did not know by Guy Lombardo in like 1934. Yeah, he was, um, my father was uh, playing violin, actually. Uh, Mama Prima was, a, you know, a little vaudeville uh, performer herself. And she insisted that the kids him, his brother, and his sister, who eventually became a nun, uh, played mm. instruments. Uh, sis sister Marianne played the piano, and uh, she's the one that taught me at a young age. Uh, my uncle Leon, my dad's brother, played the trumpet, and my father played the violin. Um, my uncle was a pretty established musician himself, but my father was still very young, and my, my father didn't think the violin was cool enough, and he would sneak Leon's trumpet in the closet and kind of taught himself how to play. And he was working uh, in the or pit orchestra um, under a guy by the name of Chernyovsky at the Sanger Theater in New Orleans um, when he was, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18. And he got fired. Uh, Chernyovsky didn't like the way he played, thought he was too brash. And uh, he, he, he started gigging. Yeah, he started gigging in clubs yeah. and Guy Lebo Guy Lombardo came down and found him. He actually found him twice. He took him to Chicago and they recorded and he went to New York to try to hit it big and failed miserably and went back home. <laughs> and uh, Guy Lombardo called him up again and said, let's give this another shot. I think I got a venue for you. And uh, my dad went back to New York and started playing on 52nd Street, which they named Swing Street. And the rest is history. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a amazing story. And, um, you know, your dad was, your dad and his band were doing great. And, and, and they went, they went through the explode. They exploded when he brought Sam Butera, the, the legendary saxophonist into the band, obviously Sam Butera and the witnesses. Um, you know, did you ever get a chance to speak with Sam and, um, pick his brain a little bit? You know, Sam, uh, Sam was there my whole childhood. Uh, you know, my father after the big band era, um, him and Keeley had gone to Las Vegas and um, 
didn't really get a lot of work. They were, it was kind of dried up and they, you know, we used them as sessions, musicians. And my dad came to New Orleans uh, and Sam had been playing at my father and my uncle Leon's club, the Five Under Club. Um, and he actually went to see him someplace else. I can't think, of, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name of the club, but uh, loved, loved Sam and said, look, I, I got, you know, I got action working in Vegas. I'm going to call you one day, uh, be ready. And Sam, you know, of course said, absolutely. And Sam got the phone call, uh, I believe it was 54, uh, Christmas Eve. And my dad said, wow. I got a, got a gig, be here tomorrow. <laughs> and Sam said, I can't be there yeah. tomorrow, man. I got a, I got a family. It's Christmas. Yeah. Um, so he, so he, you know, he waited a couple days and went out there. Uh, his saxophone was left in, and it is connection, I believe, in Dallas. So he had to borrow a saxophone for his first <laughs> night. And uh, they they took Vegas by storm. You know, they uh, yeah. he was he was bought in by I believe Bill Miller. I might have the name wrong uh, at the Sahara. My dad went to him and, and begged him, said, "Look, set me up in the corner. Let me play. If you don't like me uh, after two weeks, I'll leave. If you if you like me, then you got to start paying me." And um, they was, you know, this was the old time lounges that uh, were catering right. to the right. gamblers' wives. You know, there was shrimp cocktails right. and sitting, sitting, you know, subdued music, free. and that's not, and what, like not what my father was about. Yeah, he got on the stage, and it, you know, it was huge, and people were packing in to see him, and they had to make the room bigger, and then he went on to bigger rooms, and you know, eventually when um, my mother. Uh, joined the band and they were playing at the at the Sands, you know, opposite the the Rat Pack, and the Rat Pack would Amazing. come in, you know, for the late shows. And I mean, my you know, uh, my father was good at that. He was reinvented himself a million times, stayed fresh, stayed on top of things, and absolutely never stopped jumping around and entertaining. Amazing. Amazing. Um, you know, for my audience that doesn't know, we're talking like mid fifties, early early or late fifties, early sixties. Um, you know, the, the Vegas back then was it was still run by the guys with the crooked noses. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, so it, it was a different vibe. You know what I mean? Nobody, you know, like I said, I mean, people would just fill the lounges up for free and just come in and have a couple of drinks and, you know, on the way home. And, you know, you get to see Louis Prima in his prime, you know, yeah. and, and, and he it, revolutionized it, everything. Oh, Murray. Well, he did. I mean, he took a, you know, um, Vegas was young back then and it was a, it, it was starting to become the Hollywood playground. Uh, you know, it was where the Jeff Setters went and, you know, the wealthy to go play. Um, and my, you know, my father helped put entertainment on the map there. He, uh, right. you talk to any Vegas historian or music historian and they will tell you that, uh, he changed the face of music. You know, when you hear lounge music, you get a very odd sense of what that is because of Bill Murray right. on Saturday Night Live and, you know, some of the shows you see yes. where the lounge band is really quiet. Like a hotel, like a, ho lounge. Yeah, like, a like a hotel mm -hmm. lobby or something, you know? Yeah, but the lounges back then, man, were big stages and light shows and it was... Uh, you know, it was it was the cocktail lounge, and and they were people were packing them in, and and mm. my, you know, and, and it was because of my father, and it grew to, I mean, the lounges were still around and pumping in the eighties, uh, you know, and almost into the nineties, where it was a, uh, you could find good music almost any time of the day, um, you know, wailing in the lounge, and that was that was bought on by my father, and he turned that into you know, the fourth or fifth life of his career and uh, wrote it wrote it until it was time to move on, you know? Yeah. And for my audience out there who, you know, who may be new to Louis Prima, I mean, he was huge, like we just said. I mean, the people that would stop by to w watch him or listen to him play, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis would stop by, Peggy Lee, Dinah Shore, um, you know, many, all, obviously a lot of the huge comedians of that era, the Rickles of the world back then, they were just, I right. gotta go see Louis Prima. If, he, if he's down, if he's playing the Sahara, I'm going to see him. You know, just to show you how Absolutely. big he was. I mean, the, re, the respect that they had for him. You know, these, and, these big yeah. names. And, you know, and, and I guarantee, you know, for, for your listeners out there, you know, you, you're, that don't think they know him. Um, when I travel around, I mean, uh, people is, you know, 
uh, as young as uh, five, six, ten in their teens and their early twenties, thirties. Um, they're big fans, and if they aren't big fans yet, uh, I, you right. can start mentioning some of the songs. You know, just a gigolo, jump, jive, and wail. Uh, when you bring Angelina. up that he was King Louis, King Louis in Jungle Book, um, that's when everybody knows it and goes, "Oh yeah, I listen to his music all the time." Yeah. And you know, and it wasn't just. You know, the, 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 the big names back then that he was influenced. I mean, I've had conversations mm-hmm. with, uh, with Vince Neal, uh, from Motley Crue and Snoop Dogg. Oh. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, look at David Lee Roth, a consummate rocker and, uh, uh Ronnie James Dio of all people. Wow. Uh, you know, Brian he was Seth's, a huge Brian heavy Seth's metal like- artist. Yeah, they all they all grew up on it. They all listen to it. They all idolize it. I mean, uh, Los Lobos. I, I can the the list is endless. People that I've had conversations with uh, that Louis Primo is an influence on the light on their musical careers. Because I think the one thing my father got that a lot of people still don't is that music is supposed to be entertainment and it's supposed to make you happy. It's okay to do a ballad once in a while and sing a sad song, but in the end. Music is supposed to be uplifting, man. It, uh, since the dawn, since yeah. cavemen were banging Amen. on rocks, it's supposed Amen. to make you happy. You know, right. e- even Amen when is you, right. You go, even when you cut through a subway and you see a gentleman banging on a drum, a, a five-gallon, you know, bucket, you know, you stop and you say, "Wow, that's talent." You know, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and you yeah. know, my father, my father got that from his upbringing in New Orleans. You know, the uh, music, music was very happy, and I mean, you know, you look at. You look at the funerals, you know, there's always somber music going to the grave site. And as they walk away, it's a party and the music hits and it's uh, it's a time for revelry. And my, my father understood that. And thankfully, he instilled that in me and him, me and my band understand it. And uh, yeah. it's uh, it's it's a joy to see people get enjoyment yeah, out it of really it. Is. Yeah, because if you can't get up and move to Louis Prima or Louis Prima Jr., you might be dead. You might check a pulse, check for a pulse. No, really. I mean, it, uh, yeah, it, it, no, it's absolutely true, you know. And I hear uh, one of the things I love is uh, traveling around and doing what I do is you get to hear so many amazing stories. And, you know, invariably, you, you know, quite often you'll get the, you know, the somebody pulling at your heartstrings, you know, their, their father or mother is in the hospital and it's, you know, they're, definitely on their way out. One of the things that's, that brings them up and lifts them up is a Louis Prima song. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's incredible, <laughs> uh, that he was able to touch people like that. Right. And people have such vivid memories of, of sneaking out a, you know, ditch in school and going to see him wherever oh, when they were little. And, yeah. and if you come, if you come to the, you ever get a chance to, <laughs> see the exhibit at the jazz museum in new orleans there's actual letters from my father that that he was writing and they would hand out in school telling kids to please stay in class and it's uh you know he he just touched everybody and everybody that listens to his music even today if you're finding him anew today you're going to find a a bucket full of things that are just going to make you smile and want to dance yeah, and you know, I, sometimes I play I play jump, jive, and whale with my kids. Uh, you know, we put the microphone thing on, and uh, you know, it's a workout. It's a workout. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know? oh yeah. <laughs> it really is. You know, thanks, thanks, mom and dad for hooking up and yeah. popping me out. Excuse the excuse the French, but uh, I love it. You know, <laughs> I know it's fantastic, and, and you know, Louis Prima's music is like if you get like a whole room full of people and everybody got tased with a gun. That's how you dance yeah. to Louis Prima. <laughs> You know, it's <laughs> <Yes>, exactly <laughs> that's right, how man. you dance to Louis Prima. Some people, my audience, don't know what I'm talking about, but if they see a Louis Prima song or even a junior, it's amazing to watch. It's like they're like he's like, like bouncing around like like a you know like a jumping bean, and it's crazy. But God bless him, and you know the energy that he had to have because I'm not sure did he do one show that night or, or two shows back then? Oh no, when he was uh, back uh, back when Vegas hit. They did five shows. His last Holy show was crap. like three in the morning. Oh yeah, five shows. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, go find Amazing. people that can do that. You know, twenty-two <laughs> weeks yeah, okay. in a row. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, uh, Louie, you, you you mentioned your mom, Gia Mayoni. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Wrong. But uh, she she came into the band in 1962 when Keely Smith left. Um, you know, 
she obviously was an influence on you because she taught you how to play drums. I mean, talk about your mom yep. if you can, but her musical talent. Well, the name it's it's pronounced my own. Pretty simple. Oh, um, my my, my, oh, my grand yeah my hip my grandfather like your own my own. Um, <laughs> my grandfather was born on a boat coming over from Italy. Uh, they uh, he had the first Italian bakery in New York and uh, oh, quickly moved oh, into restaurants and nightclubs uh, back east. And um, my mom. Uh, my grandfather always had a Hammond B3, and he had a bar when when we used to go out there as kids on Seaside Heights, which is the boardwalk and the big uh, you know amusement rides and things. And he owned a bar there, and he had a B3 in the bar. He loved to play, and you know, of course, my my sister and I mean my my mom and her sister, um, you know, were in music and theater all through school, and my mom's uh, uncle. Who owned a restaurant was very good friends with Rolly Diorio. Uh, that was my dad's bass player at the time, and my godfather actually. And um, my father was auditioning singers at the Latin Casino in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And my mom saw the ad for it and begged her parents to please, you know, let her go. And they they called, you know, my my great uncle and he got my mom on the audition list through Rolly. And Ooh. so the story goes, it was they, there was a woman's cotillion, uh, was the entire showroom at the Latin theater. So my mom was sitting there in a poodle skirt and saddle shoes and with these, you know, girls in sequin gowns trying to be singers. And my dad let everybody sing and, he kept popping off songs to her. My mom was a huge Louis Prima fan, so she knew all the songs, could sing everything he threw at her, and then he stuck his hand above their head so the crowd could give their opinion. And right, the right. crowd loved my mom. Uh, he hired her on the spot, and the very next night, she opened at Basin Street East. Her second night with the band, she was on the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, wow. And she, you know, my, my mom... Uh, played piano, played drums. Uh, she bought me a little drum set. Uh, I, I posted a picture on social media several times. Tiny little, you know, drum set. I think I was five or six in the picture. And uh, she taught me how to play the drums. And she, um, you know, she was every bit the entertainer that my father was. Quite different from what Keeley was. Uh, you know, Keeley had the deadpan thing that my father right. had. Right, she's, like, jo she's um, like Joey Bishop. They would have been a great couple. Exactly, she, Joey she, she was the, <laughs> she was the straight man. She was the straight man uh, in the act, and that was part of that act. And but my father knew right. you can't make somebody you can't make somebody mimic something that people adored. You know, my father's had brilliant musicians his entire career. Pee Wee Russell on the on the clarinet. Uh, um, I mean, just countless people through his career have passed through and been in the band. And he just, he always knew to let that person shine how they could shine. And my mother shined in her own special way. And it's, 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 it's a kick to me. A lot of people will come up to me and, uh, you know, I, I saw your father in Keeley and they'll give the year of like 66. And I'm like, well, that was my mother. Um, you know, and mm, right, uh, right. you know, and and she had. If you listen to her stuff, my mother had the most incredible voice. Not because she's my mom. I mean, I really love her voice. All of my friends uh, in the music business that I've grown up with adore her voice. Um, she was tr she was truly an incredible talent, and uh, you know, she um, was handed a rough card there at the end with my father getting sick, and she maintained the music she recouped all the rights and kept putting the music out and kept his name viable and relevant with the you know with the documentaries that we did and, yeah. and with the with the exhibits and the museums and stuff and you know it's uh, dear to her heart to keep his name going and to give to uh, educational programs around the country one of the things i'm fortunate to do is part of the gm prima foundation is we give out like an ASCAP scholarship every year. We we play benefit events for uh, bus and programs and festivals that, that raise money for children's education and things. And she was passionate about it. And, you know, her hers is a Cinderella story. Joining my father at, you know, she was, what, 21? And, 
you know, you go amazing. you go to audition, and two days later, you're on you're on Ed Sullivan with the number one right. act I mean, in the country. I mean, try to di- try to like you know, put yourself in her shoes. Twenty one years old back then. I mean, we don't. I don't even remember. I mean, I was half drunk when I was twenty one. I don't remember anything. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> you know, just just you know, just, just all of a sudden, hey, Mike, you're gonna be on the Ed Sullivan show? What tomorrow? What are you crazy? I will still yep. be hungover. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. We were kids back then, you know. <laughs> but it's just funny to see hear these stories. And thank you so much for sharing them. Um, Absolutely. Louis, so on, on, on July 25th, 2010, in front of the Montalban Theater in Hollywood, 32 years after your dad's death, um, he finally gets his star in the Walk of Fame. I mean, talk a little bit about what that meant, not just for you, but your entire family and what he would have thought about it. Well, you know, the, the Hollywood Walk of Fame, like many things, like the like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, is, is a lot of who you know and how much money you got in your pocket. And, right. And, and my mother tried for many, many years to get him on the walk of fame. And she was repeatedly told, uh, in no blessed words, uh, we don't give stars to dead people. Um, oh. and they, they, yeah, they call them posthumous stars. They like to make pomp and circumstance out of the event. And, you know, you can understand that it's, a uh, drives right, money right, to the right. business. It's a tourist action, whatever. Um, so it was actually my management team um, at UD Factory um, out of Las Vegas and, and uh, one of the uh, partners at the time, Michael Lakata, uh, that had the connections at the star ceremony through uh, the Montalban Theater and a couple other people he knew in Hollywood um, that instigated the conversation again to get him a star. And we were, uh, it's, it's a, it's a funny story. Now I, I went to school with Jimmy Kimmel. I went to high school with Jimmy Kimmel and his oh, wow. sax player, wow. Clito, Clito Escobedo. We were in the band together in, in Clark high school in Las Vegas. <clears throat> and it was the hundredth anniversary or 50th anniversary or whatever of the rock of fame. And they were trying to have a major celebrity get a star so they could make a big event out of it. And they offered it to Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Kimmel said no, because he wanted to do it on his anniversary of the show. So they were kind of left without somebody and my management team convinced them that we were, this was the name to do it. And we could incorporate Capitol records up the street and Louis Prima jr. Can play out in front of the Mon theater and we'll make a, we'll make an event out of it. And the long story short on that is that aside from John Lennon's star, uh, it was the most attended star ceremony in the history of uh, the Walk of Fame and uh, an incredible event. There was there was press from 138 countries. Uh, Capitol Records opened their building for the first time for tours. And we go in there and they got a whole Louis Prima set up um, and they're using Sing, Sing, Sing. uh, and, you know, it's, we, we, you know, we in the family know that it's a political and a money driven event, but it's still very important for us to get my father the, um, recognition, recognition, recognition. that he deserves. Um, right. so to be able to have that and have, have it done in the way that it was done, man, it was, a, it was, a um, it was an incredible event all around and, uh, and, uh, a long overdue. Uh, recognition for what he was. Yeah, fantastic. Um, you know, one of the greats, and uh, he, sh- he should be uh, highlighted. I mean, he's uh, one of the greats, and uh, again, such an inspiration to a lot of Italian Americans as well. I'm an Italian American. My parents are both from the old country, so he inspired a lot of people. And uh, God bless him. I want to get into what you do nowadays, Louis uh, Louis Prima Jr. So you mentioned some of your, some of your first bands. One of your first bands was a band called Problem Child, and this is I'm getting flashbacks <laughs> now. You opened up for acts like Winger, Winger. Oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> right, talk about being in, in, in that group when you were young. The kid well, Winger, we, wow. you know, well, I, I, you know, I got out of high school with absolutely no desire to be in the music business. Um, hmm. can't, can't really answer why, <clears throat> excuse me. It just wasn't something I was wanting to get into. And I well, maybe, started college. Maybe, I don't mean, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, Louis, but maybe it was because I don't know if you ever heard that joke. I tell this all the time when people say, well, the music industry or the acting industry say, well, do you know the difference between being a musician and a large cheese pizza is? 
A large cheese <laughs> pizza confit. A large cheese pizza. A large cheese pizza confit. A family of four. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it, maybe that, it, it's what it is. And <laughs> right. Well, and, and it's and it's the truth. I saw a lot of the struggles that went on behind right. the scenes and 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 what the business was. And um, I, you know, started college. I wanted to, you know, do business management something. And I started sitting in with. Uh, it actually one of the first bands I sat in with was my father's old band, the witnesses, uh, a bunch of the guys were playing as the witnesses at the four Queens in Las Vegas. And I would go and sit in with them and sing a song. And, you know, it, it was something to, you know, it was, it was a way for me to go drink at 18 years old, you know, uh, go, go, <laughs> sit, go sit in the lounge and be Louis Prima <laughs> Jr. Don't, and, don't threaten but, me with a then, good time. <laughs> no, right. And then it started, it, bran it branched out into um, friends of mine that were just coming up in rock bands. I'd go sing. I mean, the first song, rock song I sang on stage was uh, uh, with my sister, actually, and it was Walk This Way. And then I'd started sitting in with other bands doing rock. And one of the reasons I didn't, you know, strive for the music business is I never really felt I was a master at any of the instruments I touched. I mean, I didn't pick up the trumpet till high, uh, junior high school. And, you know, for I, I always felt that if you can't be Eddie Van Halen on your instrument, um, or at least strive for that and get close to it, what's the sense of playing? I mean, that sounds a little abrupt, but it's, it's right. kind of how I felt. I, I didn't feel I was the master at the instruments. Um, but when I got the microphone in my hand, uh, I, I'm, you know, not that I'm an uh, incredible singer, um, but I sing in tune and I sure know how to entertain. And I will very egotistically say that I will get in front of anybody and outperform them. Um, yeah, no, you, I love you doing, be... I love doing it. I, I love, uh, I love connecting with the crowd and people in the crowd. And I love making people smile so as a young kid, though, you know, you want to chase what you listen to. And I grew up on ACDC and uh, things like that and rock and roll. So I put to, started putting together a rock band. And uh, uh, there were quite a few little incarnations of it before I landed on the band Problem Child. And uh, we did that for nine years, um, toured around. And, I mean, we opened for... I mean, I opened up for the Black Crows. I opened up for uh, Chili Peppers. We opened up for Sabotage. We there were countless wow. groups that we played with, and just chasing the elusive record deal, and it just kind of never happened. And I'm a realist, and realize that uh, your time is limited. I believe um, in the young man's game. Uh, not that I'm old, but. You know, there there was a time to say, all right, uh, enough is enough, and um, take a break. So I, you know, yeah. the, the band disbanded, and I took a break and did some day jobs. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm of a management mind, so I end up uh, running food and beverage at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, and we never stopped sitting in with friends of mine though and, and doing little gigs here and there because i love music uh, but yeah, i was and raised on a family wanna, that, and, and right you, that's what i want to ask you, 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 ask you family little, you need yeah go ahead sorry when did you do when did you actually you know you did the rock and roll bands and all that stuff you, you know you did the night clubs and things like that and you couldn't get the record deal i mean was that what the point in your life after you went to work at the mccarran saying you know what i'm louis preben jr you know when did you make the transition to the dad's music well, um, I put a little band, I put a band together kind of shortly after the uh, rock and roll fizzled and, um, because I knew that Brian Setzer um, was putting an orchestra together and I, uh, I had friends in the band Royal Crown Review and um, there was, I knew the swing scene was starting to make this little revival back then. So I figured, let me let me try to take a, swing at this but i i concentrated more on working in vegas and it was just bad timing the lounges were going away and i didn't really right. want to travel at the time so it was 
not the right time. And I quickly just said, no, let me, I'm frustrated with the music business. Let me take a break. Um, now it was a friend of mine while I was working at the airport that, uh, you know, and I, and I always knew that I would get back into it one day. I didn't know doing what, uh, but uh, it was just a weird opportunity and the opportunity never arose, never went to anything, but it was a friend of mine that got me back into music and hired the first set of bands and actually managed me for a while and talked me into getting back on stage to, uh, because there was a la there was a room looking for a Louis Prima type band. And, um, hmm. <laughs> it, it was, you know, I, I knew it could be a starting off point. I knew my kids were old enough to know that I'd be gone once in a while and, they were old enough to uh, take care of themselves, my two boys, and I started working. And it wasn't, though, until I found the band that I took the jump and quit the airport. Um, I, knew I, I knew I didn't want to just do Louis Prima music. Um, I didn't want to be a tribute band. I wanted to be able to create new music and to move the music into the future. I wanted to be able to do an ACDC song as if my father were doing it with horns and, you know, I, I've always felt that a good song was a good song. And if you throw horns in it and that, uh, Louis Prima shuffle beat, it's going to be a great song. Um, so I, I knew where I wanted to go. And the first thing was to find band members that did not stand behind a music stand and nothing mm -hmm. against it. I played with monsters in the industry. Everybody that's been on stage with me, uh, that I've shared a stage with are complete, amazing musicians and talented individuals. Uh, but I needed the band like I have now. And it was, it was a, you know, four or five year stint looking for everybody. And once I got it all solidified, which was actually shortly before the star ceremony, the, the first big gig was jazz fest of that year, 2010. Um, and we, I said, all right, that's it. Sat the kids down, said, this is the band. I'm going to make a go for it uh, and see what happens. And haven't looked back since, uh, I mean, I've been, I put this, started doing this in 2004, 2005, uh, but really hit the ground running in 2010 and, and haven't looked back. And it's the, uh, I've got the greatest band. I've, I've got the most talented little dudes and, and girl and, uh, even though we've made a change here or there, it's been a solid unit. We're friends. We're, they're entertainers. Everybody takes the mic and is part of the show. And somewhere along the way, at age 45, I got a record deal. And I went, well, who would have thunk that? You know? Hmm. <laughs> you, you, Amazing. You, the record deal I was chasing in the 80s with the rock band, suddenly I got a record deal. I found a, a record label came along that believed in what I was doing and would give us a chance to write music and, and do our own thing. And, uh, we've actually, the first album Return to the wildest we recorded in Vegas at a good friend of mine's, uh, Vinnie Castaldo's studio tone factory. Everybody records there. Um, but when we signed with warrior records, um, they put us in Capitol records and put us in there twice. Uh, we do have a third album that's sitting on the shelf waiting for uh, music to come back around, and I can't wait to get the third offering right. out. Amen. But, um, uh, uh, we've, correct, me for, correct me if I'm wrong, Louis, but that, you mentioned that, that the second album, Blow, that was re recorded at Capitol Records. It, was that, it, that was in the same studio where your dad and your mom recorded Absolutely, and so was the third album when it comes out. And, you know, we got a chance to play on the same mics and you use the echo chambers wow. and it's, uh, oh, it's, wow. it's a magical play. It's a magical, magical place. Uh, we used, uh, on the album blow, um, uh, Jim urban from warrior records, uh, talked with the people at Capitol and, and got permission to use a Louis Prima song and Hey, let's do a duet with you and your father. Um, but oh, he had the idea nice. that we would, you know, we would have my band play the music. We'd throw my father's voice on there and, and his trumpet. And it was hard to find a song to do that because they recorded with just two microphones back then. So it was hard to get something to isolate mm. his voice. And we found That's My Home, which is a 
great little uh, you know song about New Orleans, and I got to do a duet and play a trumpet duet with my father, which was just magical as hell. Excuse my French, uh, you know, listening and playing it at Capitol Records and all. And uh, there may be a surprise on the upcoming album as well. I can't say for sure because that deal isn't a done deal. But um, what a what a unique and a neat opportunity, and I'm thankful to have the record label uh, as part of my team. You know, we, we all have a one mindset and that's bringing music to the world. So, um, uh, and I've been fortunate to tour the world because of it. And we, you know, unfortunately 2020, we canceled over 120 yeah. dates. Um, and we're just, we're just looking forward to get back, getting back on the road yeah. and, and bring, bringing music back to people, you know? Hey man, because you know, hopefully, in a, hopefully, in like three or four months, or maybe, hopefully, sure, whatever what the time is, time frame is. I mean, you better get some rest because you and your band are going to be very busy. And, uh, <laughs> we all <laughs> we all call each other once in a while and go, "Oh my God, I don't know if I could." I mean, I it's it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it must be for, you know, for, we don't. Well, we don't rehearse. Our rehearsals are sound checks. Uh, Louis, uh, where, where can people listen to your music or maybe purchase some of your music? Well, you can always go to Louis Prima, J-R, Louis Prima Jr. Dot com. There's links on there to get everything. But we're on iTunes. We're on Amazon. We're, uh, uh, you can find us on Spotify. Um, wherever music is sold, uh, there, there's a link through the website to Warrior Records. That's where you can go to, if you can't find it in a record store, even you know if, uh, if there is still a record store in your town, if you can't find one. You can go to Warrior Records and purchase a hard CD. Where um, I, you know, the plan was to have vinyl coming up on the third album, possibly, and because uh, I know vinyl is making a resurgence, I love yes. it. Yes, amen. Um, you can get, amen. You, can get the, <laughs> you know, you you can get the hard CDs uh, for right now um, through the website through Warrior Records, um, but they're everywhere. I mean, Best Buy. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you really want to see the. If you want to see the videos, I mean, YouTube, I mean, I highly recommend it. He's watching you guys on YouTube. and, uh, and I, I, It's, I, I it's a lot of it's, fun, and, and I, I wish it, well, I wish it would more cap, encapsulate and capture what we do. I mean, because it's equal, it's visual, it's oral. I've got the best production manager in the world. He's our sound man, Donnie Palmer. He's been traveling with us now since 2014, and uh, he's the fifth be Beatle, so to speak. He, uh, make sure we sound good every night so that we can entertain and it's you know it's i've heard people describe it as just being hit by a freight train um yeah, yeah. because it's 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 non-stop it we don't you know i'll wait i'll weasel a story in every once in a while but it's non-stop it's music it's get up and dance it's get on your table and jump around whatever you want to do be part of the show get up on stage if you want we're just having a blast yeah, no, it's a uh, it's a high energy, just like your dad, and um, it's it's it truly is amazing. I mean, I, I like I said, I I knew your dad's work obviously, and then I started looking at you. I'm like, man, holy mackerel! Yeah. Look at this kid. I go. appreciate wow, it. God bless him. <laughs> no, really, I mean, you know, hey, you know, that's not easy to do what you do up there every night. I mean, thank God you're not playing four or five shows like your dad, but you know, <laughs> you know, and we, uh, you know, we we we. We've done some long hauls and it, it's rough, but it, there's something about there, there's something about when the lights come on that you, the body just yeah. does it, you know. And and yeah. yeah, we you know I stay in shape, the band stays in shape, or we wouldn't be able to do that. But it's uh, yeah. it's but it's fun. It's not forced. It's uh, there's no concerted effort, you know, to do any particular movement or anything it's it's just having fun and i like i said the entertainment's a lost art um yeah there's right. there's not yeah. a lot of not, not a lot of it in the industry today if if you remove the backup dancers uh for most of the popular people nowadays what would you have you'd have nothing because they don't even have a band so it's that's, a, that's another sh it's, that's another show <laughs> <laughs> that's another show trust me i could talk about that for days but i know i know but i know i'm with you but it's it's uh it's and it's fun you know and like i said we've met there are people that um 
we've met people along the way. Just some of the, we have some of the most amazing fans. I mean, we've got people that follow us around from city to city. Whenever we're close, they've seen us in uh, 10, 50, the, the, the uh, Scaglione's, I think I've seen us in 15 different cities. And, uh, oh. <laughs> they're, you know, friends like Charlie Dilberti, the Bullpones, there's, there, there's a, uh, 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 you know the the Floyd family. There's there, there's people that travel yeah. around to see us wow. because you don't know what you don't know what the show is going to be, you know. So they're not seeing something they've seen a million times. Um, and keep it they're fresh. Keep bringing it fresh. friends, yeah. And you know, and it's it's, it's every age group. Um, you know, we shockingly have a a, a very diverse. Uh, I think it's like thirty five to sixty five as the which is a big demographic is our key audience, but we, we get people 20 years old dancing around and things. And it's, uh, it's, it's just neat to, to see it's that what well, it, it's neat to, it's, it's, it's neat to see. And it's humbling to know that I'm somehow accomplishing what I set out to do. And that's to entertain people, no matter who you are. And I'm thankful that I get to do it. Yeah, and you do it well, and um, God bless you, and I, I really appreciate you doing this, Louis, because um, I was a big fan of your dad's, and now I'm getting, now I'm a big fan of yours, man. Hopefully you get to Boston awesome. sometime when this crap when this crap opens up, and um, love to see you perform uh, we live. Play, we're supposed to come back to the Italian festival there. What's it called, the East End? Um, uh, the, uh, the North End, St. Saint, Saint Anthony's. North East. End, yes. Yeah. St. Anthony's. We did St. Anthony's a couple of years ago. Oh my God, was that a fun really? time! Really? And we're oh my and goodness. We're, we're supposed we're supposed to come back. Um, we play also the City Winery there in Boston, but definitely yeah. keep an eye out. I'd, lo I'd love to meet you and say hi. And uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, tell yeah, you, the, tell, the you tell you in person. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, the, yeah. The, the feast, feast of feast St. Anthony's phenomenal. Usually, yeah, it's huge. It's huge. It's like it's at the end of August. It's the last Sunday of August. So hopefully you get we'll be back yep. online and definitely we'll definitely come out. That would be nice. They 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 treated us well. They they oh my god, what an organization that is that puts that whole. You're thing a paisan. You're kidding me. You're in your yeah. yeah. You're a paisan. You know what I mean? It's not like you're some you know yeah. guy from a boat somewhere. <laughs> well, we had, we we had a blast. We had a blast, and we're looking forward to coming back there for that. So yeah, keep an eye out and. Uh, yeah, yeah, we will. Louis, this has been great. And hopefully, uh, like I said, again, get some rest because you guys are going to be busy in a couple months. And um, <laughs> uh, you guys so. will be. Uh, all right, Louis, thank you so much. We'll catch up with you down the road. When the new album comes out, hit us up. We'll have you back on. Thank you, baby. All right, take care, Louis. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. All right, guys, there you have it. Uh, the great Louis Prima Jr. <laughs> Alright guys, thank you for listening. If you like this interview, please click the subscribe button for me and be sure to listen to the many other interviews on this channel like our famous Hollywood Murder Mysteries, Celebrity Interviews, and Mini Reels.